Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to outline the approach I used to get the climb times for the upcoming watch video, as well as provide a technical overview of the oxygen systems used both in 1924 and 1953 to see what impact the weight of the system had on the climbs. To establish a reasonable climb time, there have been thousands of climbs up Mount Everest from people of varying skill levels, and I've found a couple key climbs that match closely with Mallory and Irvin's climb. For a climb to be comparable, the climbers and circumstances need to be similar to that of Mallory and Irvin's. In the Mallory vs. Modern video, I point out it is not appropriate to compare George Mallory to Conrad Anker in terms of climb times, because while Conrad Anker is a great technical rock climber, his vertical ascent rate of 165 vertical feet per hour on Everest was far below the known rates for members of the 1924 expedition. On the other side of the mountain, Peter Habler and Reinhold Messner climbed the South Cold Route with a vertical ascent rate of 380 vertical feet per hour without oxygen, more than doubled Conrad Anker's rate with oxygen. Therefore, I will not compare Mallory to Messner because Mallory is not in the same class as Messner. Few people are. Much has been made of Mallory's statement that the oxygen equipment was a bloody load for climbing. On Everest, anything you carry is a bloody load, but oxygen equipment did not significantly improve until the late 90s with the introduction of various Russian bottles based on composite materials. Thus, I have chosen two climbs to analyze that use oxygen equipment that had a similar weight and was used at similar flow rates to that of Mallory and Irvin. For this comparison, I will use Ed Veister's and Eric Simonson's 1987 climb up the Norton Couloir and out in Small Gully to derive a climb time for the lower part of Mallory and Irvin's climb, that is the climb up to the third step. Veister's and Simonson started from their high camp at 26,800 sometime before sunrise on May 21st. They climbed up the Norton Couloir in a back and forth fashion. In his book, The Mountain, Veister states, Unroped, we had to focus all our concentration as we zigzagged our way upwards within the steep confines of the Couloir. Although Ed Veesters was a better climber than Eric Simonson, the issue was balanced because Simonson was climbing on oxygen. Veesters describes how the arrangement worked. In the morning, Eric got off first. He'd slept all night breathing his supplementary oxygen, and now he loaded his pack with two fresh bottles weighing a total of 36 pounds. Because he had all the weight, he asked me to carry our 500 feet of fixed rope and a few pitons and carabiners. That really didn't seem fair since I was climbing without bottled oxygen. I wanted to go as light as possible, but as it was my penchant, I didn't protest. I just said, yeah, okay. I got moving about 15 minutes behind Eric. Veesters always climbs without oxygen and is squarely in the same class of climbers as the British expeditions because in his 1990 climb up the modern route, he made the climb from modern high camp to the first step in 3 hours and 15 minutes, even though he briefly got on the wrong ledge and had to correct his route. As a note, an unsourced Wikipedia entry that says Veesters climbed an equivalent distance as Mallory and Irvin planned is incorrect. He climbed from modern high camp to an assault camp at the base of the first step. He took a couple hour break at the assault camp and then proceeded to the summit. He got briefly misdirected on the way to the first step as he had never climbed that route before, so it is not clear why it would say that Veesters knew the route. I'm working on an upcoming video where I trace the origins of various pieces of misinformation on Wikipedia, and usually it is just some well-intentioned fool trying to add something to a subject they know nothing about, which appears to be what happened here. In comparison to Veesters, the 1933 team climbed from the 1924 high camp to the first step in three hours without oxygen. Although the 1933 route is longer and was done 15 minutes faster, the times are similar enough and the circumstances similar enough to say they are in the same class of climbers. While Simonson is not in the same class as Veesters, he is climbing with oxygen and this allows him to climb slightly faster. Thus, Simonson on oxygen is about the same as Veesters without. Of note is that Simonson is carrying 36 pounds of oxygen equipment compared to a maximum of 28 pounds for a three-bottle system from 1924, and I'll get into the details of the oxygen equipment shortly. It is curious, in the two books Simonson wrote about Mallory and Irvin's climb, he did not point out that he himself had no difficulty carrying an even heavier load up what was Mallory's rock band route. A Mallory and Irvin researcher named Pete Poston provides a possible scenario for Mallory and Irvin climbing out the small gully, and I'll link to his story in the description. I like Poston's work because he is honest about things. In his article, he states that his theory requires you to ignore Odell's sighting, but notes that this makes theorizing so much simpler. I have to say that reading that almost made me suffer the same fate as Chrysippus. But humor aside, his analysis of climb times is pretty accurate, and he arrives at substantially similar rates to those I end up using. So it's worth taking a look at his article. I'll also use a lot of Poston's work regarding George Mallory's watch, so it is well worth looking at that as well. In terms of Simonson and Veester's climb, they do not summit, turning around about 300 feet short because of an obstacle. They also do not take the direct route up to the summit from the exit from the small gully, which was the route climbed by Phil Urschler. Veester's explains why they could not climb the direct route. In the post-monsoon season of 1984, 
Phil Urschler had faced only packed snow on the summit pyramid, so he had been able to climb straight up to it from the top. In May 1987, that same pyramid was reduced to bare rock and a few patches of ice and snow, so Nayarak had to angle right, traversing the slope until he intersected the top of the West Ridge route pioneered by Tom Hornbean and Willie Unsold in their gusty climb in 1963. We were only 300 feet below the summit. As a note, Phil Urschler traversed the north face pretty low and climbed up the Norton Couloir where he found the rope left by the Australians on their descent down the small gully. He used that rope to climb out of the couloir. The Australians had climbed out much further down the couloir, but descended the small gully. While this image from White Limbo is not entirely clear about the exact descent route, Tim McCartney Snape has a YouTube channel and I asked him about the descent route, and he clarified they took the small gully on the descent, noting that there was a steep step at the bottom for which they used a rope to descend. Back to Veesters and Simonson. Once out of the couloir, they don't see an easy way up and start traversing to the right. They reach an obstacle along the west ridge and conclude they could probably climb the obstacle, but because they had already used all the rope, they would not be able to safely descend. Unfortunately, Veesters does not say what time they turn around. The only time mentioned is that they exited from the small gully shortly after noon. This will work well for the analysis because the top of the exit to the gully is 28,315 feet. Their exact time of departure is also not recorded, but it can be placed between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. because it is noted it is still dark when they leave. I'll use 5 a.m. for Simonson's departure, and a variance of 30 minutes will not make much difference. Veesters also notes that Simonson was climbing on 2 liters per minute of oxygen. For comparison, the 1924 systems had a max flow of 2.2 liters, and thus Simonson's climb provides a useful comparison. In his own account of the climb, Simonson states it took them 15 minutes to cover the 415 vertical feet required to get to the high point of just 300 feet below the summit. I discount this story as climbing over 1,600 vertical feet per hour at that point is not believable. For all the times, I use the information in Ed Veester's book, The Mountain, and do not rely on the rather fanciful story told by Simonson. Comparing the two climbs, Mallory and Urban left from a high camp of 26,700, while Veesters and Simonson's high camp was 26,800. Simonson climbed with a heavier oxygen system and a lower flow rate, and both parties were reported at substantially similar altitudes, 28,500 for Mallory and Irvin, and 28,315 for Veesters and Simonson at substantially similar times, 1250 for Mallory and 12 for Veesters and Simonson. The terrain climbed is also substantially similar in that Veesters and Simonson needed to climb out the small gully. Veesters describes this as, Shortly after noon, I followed Eric as I kicked my front points up the last 60-degree slope of hard snow and emerged from the couloir. This stretch was rather desperate, so I had to move quickly and couldn't afford my normal high-altitude pace of 15 breaths per step. As a result, I became hypoxic, flopping onto the relatively flat ground above, gasping for air like a fish out of water. That would be substantially similar to the difficult sections of the zigzag route, although nothing in the zigzag has a sustained pitch of 60 degrees. Mallory had listed the exit out of the small gully as his first choice of routes. It is reasonable to assume he had climbed the zigzag because something about it made him think it would be easier. But for climb time comparisons, certainly those routes are comparable. From 26,800 to 28,315 in 7 hours gives a vertical ascent rate of 216 vertical feet per hour. For comparison, in 1924, Norton went from high camp to 28,126 in 6 hours and 20 minutes for a vertical ascent rate of 226 vertical feet per hour without oxygen. From this, I use an average vertical ascent rate for Mallory and Irvin of 250 feet per hour because they were carrying a much lighter load than Simonson and were using 2.2 liters per minute compared to Simonson's 2. The 1933 climb times were also slightly faster for Veesters, and Veesters was carrying 500 feet of rope. In addition, Veesters and Simonson fixed the rope up the exit through the small gully, which also took time. As a note, 2 liters a minute is not a lot, and it is interesting that Simonson was able to slightly outpace Veesters on such a low rate while still carrying the bloody load of 36 pounds. But Veesters was stuck with all the rope, so perhaps it makes sense. For the 250 vertical feet per hour I will use for Mallory and Irvin climbing below the third step, it should be noted that this is an average rate. Thus, they were climbing faster than 250 feet per hour out of high camp and slower than 250 feet per hour by the time they got to the third step. To see how much they slowed and to get their ascent rates above the third step, I will use the climb times of Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary in 1953. Tenzing climbed with the British in 1935, 36, and 38. In 1938, he was climbing on a team with Noel Odell and was able to keep up just fine, although they didn't get much above North Cole due to weather. By 1953, Tenzing was a top-rate climber, having just climbed the lower part of the South Cole route with the Swiss in 1952. Although Hillary has slightly less experience on Everest than Tenzing, he was also a top-rate climber. 
Tenzing and Hillary climb the south side of the mountain, but for the comparison here, the climb above the south summit on the south is similar to the climb above the third step on the north, as they are both snow slopes the entire way and each have a single difficult obstacle, the Hillary step on the south and the citadel on the north. Of the two, the Hillary step, as it existed back in 1953, was the more difficult of the two. An earthquake knocked the Hillary step down in 2015, and now it is just a moderate snow slope. Most importantly, both routes required steps to be cut. Hillary even notes at one point he tries just using his crampons and found he would slide back down and the steps needed to be cut. Below the south summit, he and Tenzing traded off cutting steps, but later an oxygen malfunction left Tenzing moving rather slow. Although they fixed the blockage in Tenzing's mask, he did not cut steps after that. Cutting steps by himself, Hillary noted how tired he was getting. This is important to Mallory and Irvin because it addresses the theory that Mallory might have proceeded alone without Irvin. Given the extensive snow slope and the need to cut steps, a second person to take turns cutting the steps would be far more useful than whatever small bit of oxygen could be provided. You can see in this close-up photo of Tenzing on the summit that the crampons used are not the modern type of crampons. Although the crampons themselves are not visible as they are in the snow, you can see the straps attaching them to his boots. Mallory and Irvin used such crampons below the North Pole, but they did not use them higher up because the straps reduced blood circulation to the feet. Tenzing's boots were made of reindeer skin and had a better design than Mallory's, but are not any type of revolutionary new technology, nor were the crampons used anything close to the modern crampons. I'll get into Tenzing and Hillary's climb times up the last portion of the mountains, but first I want to look at the 1924 oxygen system compared to the 1953 system used by Tenzing and Hillary. The basics of the 1924 oxygen system are that each bottle weighed approximately 8 pounds and held 535 liters of oxygen. A liter of oxygen weighs 1.429 grams, so the oxygen in a full 1924 bottle weighed 1.7 pounds. Irvin had made significant progress in lightening the weight of the supporting equipment such that by the time they left from advanced space camp for their summit bid, a full rig with three bottles weighed 28 pounds, with three bottles weighing 24 pounds, and the rig itself weighing 4 pounds. With three bottles, this gave a total of 1,605 liters if the bottles were full. It should be noted that just because a given pressure gauge showed less than 120 atmospheres for a full bottle, it does not mean the bottle was less than full. As basic chemistry teaches, the pressure in a closed cylinder will decrease when the temperature decreases. In addition, there is no guarantee the pressure gauge used was accurately calibrated. Thus, a pressure gauge could tell you which of two bottles had more oxygen in it and could approximately tell you whether it was full or empty, but with no calibration of the pressure gauges, I will not prorate the contents of the bottles down as it would be nothing more than pseudoscience. As only one bottle was recorded as having slightly less than the other bottles, even if that one was prorated down, it would not have effect on the analysis in any meaningful way. In contrast, the 1953 system used by Hillary and Tenzing used significantly larger bottles. The 1953 system with two bottles can be seen in Tenzing's pack in this photo. Each of the 1953 bottles held 800 liters, or 2.5 pounds, of oxygen. Two bottles contained 1,600 liters and weighed approximately 28 pounds, including the breathing apparatus, with three bottles and the support equipment weighing just over 39 pounds. The 1953 mask was far more sophisticated than the 1924 system, but it used a system designed for high-altitude aircraft. The 1924 systems used a very simple bite valve to control the flow of oxygen. The engineering problem the system is trying to solve is that you both inhale and exhale. For simplicity, I'll say this is done 50% of the time inhaling and 50% of the time exhaling, although this is not exact. If you have a constant flow of oxygen into your mouth, you will exhale 50% of it without any of it reaching your lungs. Thus, a constant flow system wastes 50% of the oxygen. To solve this, the 1953 system used a system of valves and various flow controls. It worked very well as long as there was no ice buildup, but an ice buildup is pretty much guaranteed on Everest, and Tenzing would encounter such a problem. In contrast, the 1924 system required the wearer to bite down on a valve when exhaling, sort of an inverse camelback tube for oxygen. While closed, the oxygen would build up in the rubber bladder in front of the climber, and you would be alerted if the oxygen ran out because the bladder would stop filling up. This required a bit of discipline and focus on breathing, something not desired for military pilots, but most high-altitude climbers focus on their breathing while climbing. Ed Viesters, for instance, counts the number of breaths for each step, which is a very effective technique. The added benefit of the bite valve is that by positioning the oxygen intake in your mouth, you eliminate the dead space of the mask. The 1924 system allowed a mask to be worn that could strap the tube in place, which is useful in sleeping, but is not required for normal use. Any mask creates additional dead space, that is a space of air which is exhaled and then re-inhaled without mixing in fresh air from the atmosphere. At sea level, this is a minor inconvenience, but at altitude, the decrease in oxygen and the increase in CO2 in the dead space is an unwanted side effect that is eliminated by the bite valve system. 
If I do go back for another search, the two things I'm going to use are a special type of hobnail boot and a bite valve oxygen system with the additional modification that I will run the tube inside the clothing and thus warm the oxygen prior to being inhaled. The 1924 equipment was tailor-made for the problem of climbing on the mixed ice and rock route on the north side with the only significant improvement being that modern crampons are far superior on the snow slopes. As I will be searching lower down, I will be using substantially similar equipment to the 1924 team. Not because I'm trying to prove anything about their equipment, but just because it is far superior for that type of climbing. Also of note for the 1953 system, numerous oxygen bottles leaked, and the same solution was used in 1953 as it was used in 1924. Namely, many more bottles than were needed were shipped, and the leaky bottles were identified and discarded. By the time of the summit bid, all the defective bottles had been eliminated, and none of Hillary and Tenzing's bottles went bad on the way to the summit, even though the total defect rate for all the bottles was extremely high. Thus, in terms of engineering complexity, the 1924 system can be seen as, as primitive compared to the system engineered for military aviation. However, in terms of effectiveness for high-altitude climbing, it is superior to the 1953 system. And while the modern Russian bottles are far superior to both the 1924 and 53 bottles, the bite valve mechanism is still the best breathing system for high-altitude climbing. It is not used by modern climbers because it requires discipline and practice to use effectively. Getting back to 1953, Hillary and Tenzing used a high camp at 27,900 feet from which they would set off carrying 30-pound packs with two oxygen bottles. For reference, the first step is at about 28,000 feet. Mallory and Irvin cast a bottle below the first step and thus were carrying two bottles or 20 pounds at the same altitude. For this, I'm using Dave Hahn's account of the location of oxygen bottle number 9, which is in a position close to the exit cracks and is only consistent with it being a cash bottle or a broken bottle and the bottle was not broken because it still held pressure when it was found in 1999. Tenzing and Hillary would also use oxygen bottle caching, so they would only go to the summit with one bottle, and they would pick up partially filled bottles on the descent. For Tenzing and Hillary, these partially filled bottles were cached by an earlier team. For the summit push, Tenzing and Hillary had one bottle weighing about 12 pounds, and the rig weighed about 4 pounds for a total of 16. The advantage of for Mallory and Irvin with the smaller bottles is that the actual summit push would be one bottle of 8 pounds, and a rig with a maximum of 4 pounds for a total of 12. The advantage for Tenzing and Hillary was that they had more oxygen for the summit push. Tenzing and Hillary went on 3 liters a minute, giving them about 4.5 hours for their final uh, bottle. In contrast, Mallory and Irvin had just 4 hours at 2.2 liters per minute from their final cash. No rig was found on or near Mallory, and Odell reported seeing various pieces of the frames left in high camp. As Irvin had already optimized the weight of the system, the likely explanation for dismantling the systems is that he realized the aluminum frame was unnecessary if they were going to cash bottles. In terms of oxygen, they had 9 or 10 bottles in high camp. Here I will use 10, as that is the most likely scenario. Six bottles were carried up by the Sherpas, two are seen on Irvin in this photo, and one is clearly visible on Mallory, and it looks like the second one is present as well. This would mean 10 bottles in high camp, as all of them were taken to the high camp. By the time they got to high camp, two bottles had been used climbing, leaving eight. As there is no way they could take eight, they probably slept on one bottle each. To do this, the regulator needs to be removed from the frame because you can't fit two complete rigs in the tent as well as two people. Once removed, there would be no reason to reattach them because Irvin likely would have seen the obvious benefit of oxygen bottle caching. I'll briefly describe oxygen bottle caching for a simplified scenario. Assume you are planning a 12-hour climb with seven hours to the top and five hours back down which is what would be the best case for Mallory and Irvin, and would match the estimated climb rate of 330 vertical feet per hour that Mallory had previously stated. Let's look at that scenario without caching. Each bottle lasts 4 hours at 2.2 liters. Carrying 3 bottles to last 12 hours, you would drop your first bottle at 4 hours and proceed to the summit with 2 bottles, at which point you would turn around, climb down, also with 2 bottles, until you drop the next empty bottle at the 8-hour mark. Anyone would quickly realize that there is no reason to carry the second bottle to the summit. You can just leave it below and pick it up on your way back down. You can quickly work out you can use a similar technique with the first bottle, and caching dramatically reduces the loads you carry, which is why Tenzing and Hillary did it, the Chinese did it, Anchor and Han did it, all modern climbers do it. But most importantly, it explains why Odell saw so many pieces of aluminum in the high camp, because only the regulators were taken. The bottles would be placed in a backpack and carried the same way the Sherpas carried them up. The frames were of no use because with only one bottle they are not balanced, and constantly swapping the bottles in and out of the frame is a waste of time. They also save a little weight by not using the frame. The 1953 system solved the problem of balance by placing the bottles horizontally in the pack. By using a backpack, the 1924 bottles could be placed in diagonally and achieve a similar result. A vertical placement of the bottles will always result in an imbalance simply because oxygen has weight. For computing Tenzing and Hillary's climb rate above the south summit, 
I'm going to make one correction to the computations. Because the south summit is a subsidiary peak, when leaving it, you descend before starting back on the ascent. And on the descent, you have to reascend back to the south summit. So Tenzing and Hillary literally had to climb uphill both ways in the snow. To correct for this, I take the time from the bottom of the saddle below the south summit and calculate the time from there. Although this difference in altitude is only 36 feet, at the rates relevant here, it does make a difference. So if you don't make this correction, it looks like Tenzing and Hillary hit some wall at the south summit that drastically reduced their climb rates. This is just the result of not adjusting for the saddle. The rate above the south summit was predictably slower than below, but nothing out of the ordinary. Using this calculation, Tenzing and Hillary's time for the last 300 feet up the mountain was 183 vertical feet per hour, as opposed to 132 vertical feet per hour without the adjustment. I will use 183 vertical feet per hour as the maximum possible rate Mallory and Irvin could have ascended in that region, with the likely actual rate being a little slower. Although Mallory and Irvin would have been climbing with a slightly lighter load, because they were only going with 2.2 liters per minute rather than 3 Tenzing and Hillary used on their final push, it is reasonable to assume that the ascent rate would be less. I will put all this together in the watch video, but for now it is sufficient to note that like the myth of the second step and the myth of the killer storm, the myth of a primitive oxygen system is a false comparison. It is an example of modern bias in which we view ourselves as technological geniuses and people from 100 years ago as cavemen. However, pound per liter of oxygen, the 1924 system was nearly identical to the 1953 system, and even for the next 40 years after that, people reached the summit carrying the exact same bloody loads.